So today we're talking about privacy um, and how that overlaps with the security and ethics side of things. So um, a little bit of, of you guys, a little bit more interaction from you guys, not quite as much as the ethics lecture where essentially you guys did most of the talking, but definitely try and get a few, there are a few like really good discussion points uh, that I'd like you guys to air your opinions about uh, if you're happy to do so. Or, you know, you can just play devil's advocate if that's your thing. Certain people in the room. Uh, so, um, 1984. Who's read it? Show of hands. Alright, so if you don't know why I'm mentioning it, then you haven't read the book. Um, so, it was obviously, it's quite, a, it's, a, it's a very important piece of literature, you know, um, but, but it also a long time ago, so it was published in 1949. Uh, set in the future, the far future of 1984, um, and uh, basically it's about government surveillance, um, and the, the the premise of the book, or one of the the aspects of the book, is essentially that everyone's always watched at all times, and there's like these telly screens, which are like these TV screens in the rooms that actually watch the people in the room as well which seemed really outlandish at the time, but if you've got a um, smart TV, <laughs> it could already be happening. Um, in case you haven't heard, there, there were um, some smart TVs that had webcams in them that could be hacked into, but yeah. Um, so, so essentially there's tele screens and there's like hidden microphones in places and basically facial expressions um, would could be considered thought crimes. So basically you're told, you know, what, uh, it's like a revisionist history of things. So you're told what the truth is and you're, you have to like believe it, basically. Um, so if you have any kind of independent thought or you um, have any seditious thoughts or anything like that, then that was considered a thought crime. So um, interestingly, actually, the reality of things now in the year 2014 is that we have far greater amounts of surveillance than even Orwell imagined at the time back then. Like, we have an amazing amount of detail that you can get about people's lives and, and their opinions on things and um, what they're up to. Um, so just, you know, it's worth mentioning um, the book because if you haven't read it, which is most of you, then I would, yeah, it is a good read. It, it's good um, and I, I do recommend it. Just, you know, obviously it's just a fi fiction, but it's quite... Uh, interesting. So what's privacy? Um, it's quite complex, right? But what do you guys think when you hear the term privacy? What do you guys think it means? My things are my things and no one else's. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So your, would you like to, what do you mean by your things? Well, what I do is my business and yeah. no one else's. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so what you do is your business. Any any other? Kind of the ability, this, this, you have, um, you don't have to ask to anyone whether it is. It's kind of, like you said, it's your business, it's your business. So yeah. what, whatever you want to keep private is something that other people are looking at. Yeah, so the, the right to say, to basically decide that certain things are your own business and no one else's. Um, yeah, does anyone else want to add anything? You're pretty happy with that yeah. definition? Your, what you do, I think you just mentioned what you deem as sensitive information. Right, so it's up it's to you. Private. So you get to choose what's sensitive and what you share with yeah, everyone else. Everyone's view of what sensitive information is two, three, four different things, you know? Where yeah. the, your idea of sensitivity and my idea of sensitivity could be mm -hmm. worlds apart. Yeah. So, so it's relative. Yeah. It's relative to yeah. So certain people will s hold certain things to be private information, whereas other people might be happy to share that information. Yeah. So generally, you know, that's a, that's quite a good definition. Basically, it's about an individual's right to selectively share information about themselves or to seclude themselves, and that's kind of like a physical point of view would be modesty. It's like you know, your right to wear clothes and you know, not have to bear everything to everyone all the time uh, and being able to have your own space. So in like Western society, for example, 
we would say, you know, you'd have your own bedroom like, a, a lot of the time, that somewhere you could go just to be by yourself. Um, and, you know, obviously different households have different kind of uh, expectations of that. So if you, you may have shared a room growing up or something like that, and obviously it's a different level of privacy than if you get your own room that's just yours, where the people knock before they enter the room and things like that. Um, so basically having your own space that you can just like relax in and not worry about anyone else. Um, but then from the information point of view, which is obviously what all you guys were talking about and what's more relevant to this module, is like you know how you share that information or when you decide whether or not you want to share that information. So for example, you might have a medical history. Maybe you've got um, a history of, of cancer in your family. You know, should you have to share that with everyone that you meet? Or you know, can that just be something that you yourself know? Um, like your political point of view. Are you conservative or liberal? Do you, um, you know, do you have to share that with everyone that you meet? You know, because obviously it changes the way people think about you. Maybe you don't have a political point of view, but should you be forced to share that with everyone that you ever meet? Um, or would you be happy to post it on your Facebook page? Um, religion, like, do you, you know, do you have a religion? Are you an atheist? Are you a Christian? Are you Muslim? I, you know, or some sort of flavour of each of those things, and. Again, should you have to share it with everyone or do you get to choose who you tell about that and who you have those discussions with? Or should everyone just be out front with everything and be willing to argue with everyone that they meet in their whole life about what their religion, re religion is and what their you know, point of view on that is? Your own opinions about something. You don't like someone, should you have to tell them? Right? You know, it comes down to all sorts of things. So there's a whole lot of information that people choose when to share it. And if you had to tell the truth all the time, then you end up with a ridiculous Ricky Gervais movie or something, uh, which I don't recommend. Um, but you know, the, you know, you say, although he, you know, he's quite good in other things. But um, I'm happy to share that opinion with you guys. Uh, so privacy. So I guess the question is, what do you guys think? Do people have a right to anonymity online? So if you um, have an opinion about a political thing that's been posted on you know, some website and you want to share your opinion about it, do you have a right to do that anonymously? Yes. I think you sort of, you have to accept the rules of engagement when you post something on the internet. If you yeah. write a blog about what is a controversial, controversial subject mm -hmm. and you're applying for a job, let's say it's something political, yeah. um, you have to accept that there's a risk that the potential employer will Google your name and your blog will come up and they might read something they don't like and want right. to give you the job. But so you have to accept that if you do post online, there is a risk that, that things that you may want to keep more private will Yeah. So what you're saying is if it's private, don't share it in the first yeah. place. Yeah. So um, does anyone want to counter that? <laughs> yeah. So, so the question is: Should do do people in Russia have a right to anonymity to post things online? Yeah. So. Because it, you know, yeah. I think I think they should have. Yeah. But again, you have to accept that if you decide to go go and post, you have to accept that there may be consequences. Whether it's right okay. or wrong, it's not. So hypothetically, well, if there was a way of being anonymous, do you have a right to it? Yeah. I think I think with Twitter, so, yeah. then you shouldn't. You shouldn't be anonymous because the amount of people that abuse Twitter, like Twitter trolls and stuff, mm -hmm. cause such offence. And um, like, say for example, take you know the Boston bombings, when the footage of the suspects came out and people said, "Oh, I recognise that person," and then they go and target that person, but it's not that person. Yeah. So things like that, and also with the Twitter trolls attacking people. I don't think they should be anonymous. I think everybody should know, or there should be some way of tracking them back to the person. So if you post something offensive, right. like a, a rape threat or a death threat, then you can be tracked down and punished for that. 
Right. So okay, so but okay, let's let's talk in a hypothetical world where we can have anonymity if we choose to allow people to do it, right? Because there are things you can do, and it's quite complicated. But all right, so there's two arguments that have come, two really good arguments that have come out of this. One side have said, well, what about you know the fact that if you don't allow people to be anonymous, then they might not be able to share their opinion at all. So, for example, they'll be vilified or whatever for sharing an opinion. So that certain countries are mentioned as being places where you're not allowed to share certain opinions. And then the other side of it was, well, if you let people be anonymous, then they do things that they wouldn't do otherwise, and in fact might be more offensive to people and just like not practice like common courtesy to people when they know that they're anonymous. Um, so which one trumps which? I mean, what, if you had to decide whether or not people are allowed to be anonymous, you have to choose between do you let people share their opinions about things or do you stop people from sharing their opinions to protect people, other people's feelings? I'd say the, uh, the one where the least, which will affect the most people. So you're doing it to protect, to prevent 0.1% of the population from doing something bad that affects everyone else, then yeah. the thing that doesn't affect everyone else. So, and from the ethics lecture, we know that that's known as uh, utilitarianism. So what's, what's the greater good? Um, so, um, yeah, so you're arguing the greater good is actually the, the rights of people to have an opinion as opposed to the, um, the harm that comes from people's opinions being, like, feelings being hurt from, like, statements online and things. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's an interesting, that's an interesting argument. So, um, the, you know, when it comes to crime and stuff, then there's that whole other side of things as well, like tracking down a perpetrator of a crime, and that can be used to argue on the side of non-anonymity as well. So what if you want to find who was, you know, a murder suspect, and, you know, yeah. I mean, the, the fact is that if you're considered guilty of committing a crime, then the police and government have different powers in which to, to view things. Like, if mm. I, think, I think there's a law which says you now have to produce a password. You know, they see in the UK, that, yeah. In yeah. the UK, they, you have to give your password within 24 days or something like that. Yeah. I'm not exactly what it says, but... Yeah. Hmm? Regular, regular Jew Investigative Powers Act, something. What she said. Unlike in the US, where <coughs> it would be considered um, incriminating, self-incrimination, which is protected uh, by their constitution. Um, yeah, so... Um, yeah, and that's a whole other argument that we could get into. thing is, though, if you... Posting anonymously was with the online world and things like that. It's just as easy to create a fake profile and look like you're someone else. And there's nothing to stop that. There's there's nothing to stop you creating a fake profile. So what's the difference between posting as someone you're not? Surely that does more damage than posting mm. as someone who no one knows who you are. I guess the the yeah the. I guess what's coming out of this is there are different levels of anonymity. There's anonymity from other people, and then there's anonymity from like people actually doing a proper analysis and figuring it out. Does people pretend to be celebrities on Twitter and stuff like that? Yeah, and if you could make it against the law, I guess, and call and call that fraud, which in some cases it probably already is. Um, yeah. Okay. You're gonna start doing that though. You'd have to start providing passport details to Facebook to prove you were who you said you were. And and yeah. That just get crazy if you start doing stuff like that. Is it Facebook currently have a real name policy? I believe where you're supposed to use your real name. It's like one of the terms of services, and Google used to have that, but they don't anymore. I think from memory. Um, so yeah, there is that aspect of it, and you, there are certain places where you will be required to send your passport photo or something to prove your identity. And for example, if you're using a certificate authority to prove your identity, obviously. You know, if the opposite is true, if you want to prove that it's you that's saying something, obviously you do need to show some ID in order to, for that to work. Um, so we've talked about some reasons for wanting privacy. Are there any other reasons people can think of for not having privacy? And we've talked about um, two things already, which was the police side of things like investigating a crime and also people being like vilified. Um, you want to think of any anything else? If you look at utilitarianism again, then if someone has got something which actually would benefit a large number of people um, and they're choosing to keep that private, I guess that's, that's not really for the greater good if they've got something which can help that out. Yeah. Someone
known as paintings. If they what? Find a cure for cancer. And then kept it private. Yeah. Um, which is not not illegal. Which is obviously not not illegal. And in fact, they could go and paint it and then charge lots of money for something. That, anyway, um, that's a whole other discussion, which I'm happy to to um, to share my opinions about in private. So um, so so I, I guess another one I'll mention is taxes, for example. So people have to pay their taxes, and therefore you can't keep all your financial information private. Um, because you know we all benefit from the taxes that people are paying so like you know all the roads that are you know that we can drive on and you know having street lamps and stuff like that that's paid by people's taxes and if people aren't paying their taxes then you know that's not really fair on everyone else so but then again the the alternative argument is that well everyone else is trying to dodge taxes so I should too um, so yeah but yeah anyway so that's another thing that um, is an argument against privacy in certain situations but I guess um, we can probably, I think we all agree that there are certain situations where anonymity is good and some where we'll say that actually we don't want it. So there are a number of rights related to privacy and we talked about this in the ethics lecture. People um, should have freedom to thought, to think and have their own opinions about things. Um, I guess in certain countries they believe more strongly in freedom of speech and expression. So for example in the US they actually have freedom of speech, um, you know, as one of their um, fundamental rights in that country. You know, it's in their constitution and everything. Um, whereas a lot of other countries don't. So, for example, um, in Australia and the UK, it's not as much of a protected right. So, for example, you're not you would be you you're not allowed to share negative opinions about people that might hurt their. Um, like businesses, for example, in certain countries, whereas in the US, you know, that would be a protected right in certain situations. Um, freedom of association, so you should have a right to join a union, for example, or be in a society or be a member of a religion. Um, and the right to privacy, so the right to be able to choose information that you choose to share about yourself. Um, so privacy and security, can anyone think of a difference between the two? What's the difference between confidentiality and privacy? Yeah. Confidentiality. If you don't not the definition of the world, but confidentiality you're allowing is in one definition you're allowing somebody to know information about it on the proviso that they don't then pass the information to others. So for example, the relationship that a doctor would have with a patient. Mm -hmm. As opposed to privacy, which is I don't know, closing your curtains and you get to dress them. Yeah. Yeah. Um yeah, I mean, they're related ideas, but for confidentiality is about how it's protected. So yeah, you're right, you might have certain people that you allow and some, certain people that you don't. And it's the security side of it, is what do you do in order to keep certain things secret, which may or may not have to do with privacy. It might just be, you know, actual, you know, NSA secrets, for example, which isn't anything to do with anyone, any individual person's privacy. It's to do with, like, national security, or, for example. Um, and um, privacy is about individuals, and data protection is obviously the you know laws uh, and how you actually protect the the certain data from being accessed. And so, like in this country, in the UK, we've got the Data Protection Act, which one of the principles of which I think it's principle seven says that you put in place adequate security to protect people's informa private information. So that's how they're related. Um, so um, also the Data Protection Act says that businesses shouldn't store more than they need. So if you are, um, I don't know, say for example <clears throat> you're paying your taxes and the government asks that in order to calculate your taxes we well, you need to know, you know what your age, sex, religion, uh, political persuasion, all this sort of stuff is, you go, well, no, I don't know if I need to be telling you this in order to pay my taxes. So there, there are rules that you collect information that's actually relevant. Um, and there are instances where members of the public are required to produce personal information. So for example, for tax purposes, you need to tell the government about how much money you're earning so that they can make sure that you're paying the right amount of tax. Um, so ethics question, as a system administrator, um, is it ethical for you to read the email of other employees within the organisation? 
If yes, when? Under what circumstances? Do you suspect suspicious activity? Then I guess it's, it's your job to investigate that. And if that investigation uh -huh. takes you to employees' emails, then uh, it's when you're so when you're employed, you, you a lot of places don't let you use your email for personal for personal stuff anyway. So mm. there shouldn't be anything in that email that would be against what the sysadmin could read. Yeah. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's actually that's quite a good. I think that's quite reasonable. And you, usually, when you start working somewhere, you'll you're basically you're told what the policies for that organisation are, and you're right. Often it'll be like you just use it for work purposes, um, and you might may or may not be allowed to also use your personal emails at work, but possibly not. Depends on the organisation. Um, yeah, I think that I think you pretty much hit the nail on the head there. Um, Okay, so if I have access to a database for work, say for example a medical database, would it be ethical to look up family members and friends? No. Why not? What if I was just helping them out by like checking whether they've been to the doctor recently enough? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. Um, I have someone that I know, uh, a friend who was telling me they had access to some database related to their work and they would just look up everyone they know uh, to look up information in this, in this database and I won't say anything else um, about it but obviously um, myself and the other people involved in this conversation were all outraged. Um, it's just like, what? Like, yeah, I don't see what the problem is. Like, a local friend. Um, yeah, okay. wonder what information of mine was in that database. Um, yeah, so, but obviously, you know, you would consider that to be a breach of privacy and people that are in... Yeah. Um, so yeah, the pro... Well, their argument was, well, I have to look up all this information for my job anyway. I've got the right to look up the information. Yeah, so... Um, right to look at that information for your work purposes and if your, mm. your work assignment isn't to look up your family members. If you've never been, if no one's ever explained that to you, then you might not realise or you might not have really thought about the, the you know, Everywhere the consequences. Isn't an excuse anymore. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. And, well, you know, we were all outraged. But it, so the point is some people have like different level, different ethical like ways of looking at the world and um, but generally speaking that would be considered to be a breach of privacy and if you do have access to information then you should only be using it for the purposes for which you've been given access to that information so for example if you're a police officer and you have um, you know rec everyone's criminal records and everything like that if someone just a mate of you asked to look someone up in that database do you do it so, you, so you've got, so you're a police officer. You've got access to all all of that information. Your best friend is about to hire someone new, but they seem like they might be a bit dodgy. They couldn't find anything online about that person. But could you just look up the person in the database just to check whether I'm hiring someone that I, it's going to be in a trusted position within this business? Would that be okay for the police officer to do that? That person can do um, a CRV check instead. Right. Is that going to give you everything that could be might? You know that might you might have already done that and decide well, I'm still not sure whether there is stuff that's on their record that I can't access. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, I don't think um, the policeman sh shouldn't do that. Yeah. Although he, he he's he can do quite easily, but if the person has gone for a CRB check for our good sake. Yeah. The police will get the same information that the CRB. Really? Um, well, give or take. Might be a little bit. Apart from a little slap on the hand, but that's not really a record. You know, if you've got a record, yeah. that will appear on, on your CRB. Right. You know, uh, okay. the only thing that wouldn't is if you had uh, maybe a caution from the police. Yeah. And I, do, I, I don't think it, it's right anyway. Yeah. So. Okay. Um, okay, so we're talking about privacy, right? Um, sometimes you voluntarily sacrifice some of your own privacy, right? 
So when you enter in a <clears throat> some kind of competition, they might ask for your email address. Now in order to enter that competition, you're giving away some of your own private information. If you're using any online free services, um, he, who here has a Google account? Show of hands. <clears throat> Put your hand down if, you ever, if you've ever given Google money. No, if you've given them money, put your hand down. Okay. So the, those of you guys that have your hands up, um, you could argue that you guys are actually Google's product. You're not their clients, right? So their business model involves selling your information to other people or using that information for financial gain via advertising, right? So if you've never given Google any money, you're not, you're not their client, right? You, they're not getting any money from you. They're not, they're not a charity, Google or a business. So you are actually their product, right? Um, and in order to use their services, <coughs> the price that you're paying is your privacy, basically, right? The price is, is your privacy and you know being exposed to advertising and stuff like that. Even if you don't pay Google, don't Google get more money for the more users they get? They get more revenue from advertising, so yeah. even as free users, you're still generating them more income. Exactly, but how do they make money from advertising? By trying to target advertising at people who are likely to click on the ads, and how do they do that? By collecting your personal information. So, <clears throat> so um, you know, and the same with Facebook, same with, I don't know, whatever other free services you use. You know, but can you name some free services that you, some free services you guys use on the internet? YouTube. Yeah. SoundCloud. Yeah. Any others? Twitter. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, all those sorts of things. So, all those organizations are basically trying to find some way to, um, to make money, basically. And often it's not directly, so because people aren't willing to pay for these things, you know, for it, for a search engine, basically, like if you if Google turned around and said, ah, you have to pay five dollars a month to access the Google front page search engine, what do you think would happen? Switch to yeah, you'd start using something else, um, and you know, unless that you really thought that had some kind of differentiation that was worth your money. Uh, so they're trying to find other ways of making money. So how much money do you think you're sacrificing, sorry, how much privacy do you think you're sacrificing or should you be um, forced to sacrifice in order to use these products? So for example, real, real name policies on like Facebook and Google Plus is that should they be able to force you to show some ID and prove that you are who you say you are? Show of hands, yes, that's, I think that's a good idea. Uh, one person, and it, and so who thinks that that wouldn't be reasonable? I'm just checking whether there's anyone that's like to on the fence. Uh, some people don't know. Um, so, um, so okay. So most of you would would think that that's too much. Asking, uh, asking you to to tell them your name is too much. You're saying. What about um, the, the all the other information that you're willing to to put into these? Things. I mean, how many of you guys um, click the little Facebook like icon on other websites that aren't Facebook? You know, when the little hand appears, do you click to show to to basically say that you like things? They're annoying. Put an ad on Yeah. Show. Uh, okay. Show of hands if you don't. Don't click the like button. Oh, that's actually a lot more than I thought it would be. Um, so. Um, but did you know just by visiting a website with that like button on it, Facebook knows that you were there. So um, Facebook will track you across the internet everywhere that, where there's those buttons are available because you know it phones back to them with you know shares a cookie and everything, so they know that you were at that website. Is that only if you were logged in? Well, it could be, but then again, it wouldn't need to be. Uh, it wouldn't need to be um, because they whether or not you're logged in, they could still store that cookie on your computer that says who you are. Um, so, not necessarily, uh, but po possibly. Um, okay, so 
Here's a nice, interesting quote from Eric Schmidt of, of Google. If you have not something that you don't want anyone to know, maybe you shouldn't be doing it in the first place. But if you really need that kind of privacy, the reality is that search engines, including Google, do retain this information for some time. And it's important, for example, that we're all subject in the United States to the Patriot Act. It's possible that information could be made available to the authorities. And he also said, true anonymity is too dangerous. Uh, so this is, you know, one of the leaders of um, Google. So what could go wrong? What What's the worst case scenario of, um, you know, a lack of privacy? What, how could that be used against you? Yeah? Yeah, identity theft? Yeah? Well, it's not a worst case scenario, but it's pretty bad. So say, for example, if you Google something about medic ongoing medical condition that you have, mm -hmm. and then, say, for example, I don't know, you find out you have cancer or something like that, and you think, well, there's a possibility my life could be ending shortly, so you want to get out of life insurance. Mm -hmm. Then again, if they have access to that, those details about you, they're going to bump the price up. Right. You will get some fraud to do that when you have a illness and take out. Well, I, I don't know the specifics, but like I wouldn't know, want banks and other things knowing my exact medical condition sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so actually it is illegal to take out health insurance without declaring known medical Could problems say, to them. Well, um, it would be void anyway. So, so, sorry? I was going to say, don't face any illness, especially something as severe as that on a Google search, would actually go to a doctor. Yeah, yeah, go to it. Go to a doctor. That's a good advice. But all, but actually, what are a related? A related note would be a family member hops on your computer and they say like adverts for cure, cures to cancer or something. I'd be like, oh, it's a bit weird. But I mean, interestingly, I I had a baby recently, right? And um, before we'd even told anyone about it. Amazon were trying to sell me baby products, right? <laughs> so some kind of search or something we'd done like on the computer to hold Amazon that we had babies. I can't imagine what it was. Um, <laughs> um, but Amazon figured out before we'd even told anyone that, that, that we had a baby come on the way and started advertising baby products. And it's just like, whoa. <laughs> um, yeah. So, okay. So yeah, any other ways that privacy could be misused? that you can think of. All right, so let me, let me t read an interesting quote from Professor of Philosophy, University of Connecticut. I would do an American accent, but I can't. Um, imagine that I could, try. Imagine that I could, no. Could, could telepath, you guys think I sound American anyway, so. Um, imagine that I could telepathically read all of your conscious and unconscious thoughts and feelings. I could know about them in as much detail as you now know about them yourself, and further, that you could not in any way control my access. You don't, in other words, share your thoughts with me, I take them. The power that I would have over you would of course be immense. Not only could you not hide from me, I would know instantly a great amount about how the outside world affects you, what scares you, what makes you act in the ways you do. And that means I could not only know what you think, I could to a large extent control what you do. So, if you, if someone knows everything about you, they can use that information to influence you. So, say for example, um, Google tracks hypothetically tracks what you're doing and notices that when they show you an advert, uh, you know, an an advert for certain types of products at a certain time of night when you, you know, you're most dazed and confused because you've just, you know, you've been working all day, you've got home, you watch TV, you sit down on the computer and you're more likely to like buy whatever it, whatever it is at night time. If they figure out that at that specific time they show you certain types of ads you spend money, then it, if they start doing that, that's good for their business, but in a way it's basically manipulation, right? So they're, well, that's what everything advertising is, is manipulation, right? There are like thousands of people thousands of people working to try and figure out how to manipulate you to give them money, basically. What is a TV advert except that? You know, all of these things are just trying to figure out how to convince you to spend your money on their products. Now, if you, some people will actually argue they like targeted advertising because then they see stuff that's relevant to them. But how targeted are you happy for that to get? Like, you know, um, and what about people that are more vulnerable than yourself? So, for example, people that have mental disabilities um, or, you know, just 
are particularly um, vulnerable and influ influence in easily influenced people. Um, you know, should they be advertising advertising targeted at them? What about children children watching TV and like ads for toys and stuff like, you know, sh you know, is that okay? You know, or should as parents you decide that you know and um, you, you know it's so that so basically it's if you're targeting vulnerable people, um, then you know, you can use private information to basically make them do things. Uh, and there is an unbalance of power between individual people and large organizations and huge massive corporations that hold all this information. So it's, you know, you're not on a level playing field when they know everything about you. Uh, and, you know, if you use Google, then they know probably more than anyone else in the world knows about you. They might know more about you than you do. Um, so you kind of lose that ability to control your own life if other people are basically manipulating you or algorithms are manipulating you. And the identity theft is what um, Emma brought up earlier. Um, it, it's, no, it's not that hard to steal someone's identity. Um, and certainly if you're on someone's Facebook friend, you probably you already have everything you need in order to basically duplicate that page and pretend to be them. Um, you know, you basically do a man in the middle attack on social media. You friend someone, copy all their data into a new profile and use that to friend other people. Um, you know, it's it's all like, there's all sorts of ways it, could, it can be misused, put it that way. So the question becomes, is it now possible to store everything forever? And it's kind of like getting getting that way, right? So, you know, as, as our storage grows and grows and grows, um, you know, you just end up amassing more and more data. And you, maybe some of you guys have already experienced this in your own lifetime where you started off and you've still got backups of everything that you ever had on your computer because you just buy a bigger hard drive each time you need one and you just end up with like your entire like history on your computer basically. And now think of that in terms of like the world where we're basically just storing all of this stuff and you know look at the NSA's new data center they're building at the moment with just like massive amounts of storage space so that they can keep records of like everything basically um, so you know what do you think that includes about yourself what kinds of information what does your digital footprint include either on your own computer or on these other people's computers <laughs> yeah, like every every internet search you've ever done in your entire life. And what do you think you could figure out about yourself if someone had access to that information? <laughs> yeah, okay. So you're all feeling a little bit out uncomfortable about that thought. Um, so... Um, yeah, a lot of lot of organizations, business models rely on gathering as much information as possible because because Google is an advertising company. No matter what else their services are, Google are an advertising company. That's how they make their money. Uh, and you know, they started probably in the last few years. They've started doing a more kind of like cloud-based services for other organizations. So that's like another aspect of their business. But a a major branch of Google's business is advertising. Um, and a lot of these IT companies actually back weak privacy laws. So they'll lobby the government for weaker privacy laws because it's in their best interest. Um, and, um, you know, so that they can get all that information because it helps them. So, you know, we're talking about the sorts of information that these, or, um, you know, companies can figure out with all this information. And uh, there's, there's an interesting little um, article here if you want to um, check it out which is basically Facebook knows if you're gay, use drugs, or a Republican, even if you don't tell them any of those facts. So they can basically figure out your political beliefs and sexual orientation from who your friends are, what are their beliefs, what are their, you know, what, what, do, what do they do, what, you know, what are your things that you've liked? If you like ABBA, for example, what does that say about you? <laughs> 
you might use that as part of an algorithm to try and come to a probability uh, as to whether or not someone has a certain sexual preference. Not that I'm certainly not insinuating anything to that. But you know, there's all these sorts of different information that you can use to try and come to these conclusions. And statistically, they'd be very accurate because they've got so much information to pull from. So Google Street View. Cars driving around the streets, and actually, it's an, a, an amazing service where you can like navigate and look at a city before you get there. Um, accidentally, they they accidentally collected all the Wi-Fi data from a, a um, for a while, and obviously, they got in a lot of trouble for that. I don't know if you guys heard all that stuff. You, you, do you guys know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Right. So they they accidentally collected. Um, like all recorded everything from Wi-Fi, including all the insecure connections, and like they had like little, you know, they got they got a slap on the wrist for that anyway. They got in trouble. Um, so you know, do you think people have any right to privacy in a public space? If you're outdoors, do you have any pr any right to privacy at all? It depends. Yeah, depends what your definition of privacy is. I mean, if you if you include under privacy wearing clothes, then obviously you have <laughs> yeah. What about if you say these people here at this sex shop, this guy coming out here? Um, the um, should he like basically accept that if he's doing something in public, everyone should find out about it? Yeah, it doesn't. The point is, you don't really because every other person in the world is equally entitled to access the street and see what you're doing. Right. So yeah, you can't have any privacy unless somehow that street is, is just for you and for no one else which is honestly what if you buy the street should you be allowed to go outside and have privacy then like satellites yeah well the, the, it ends up being a debate not over whether people can see it but how many yeah is, is it okay to to let to let the, everyone who's ever looked at that yeah. google street view to see at, what you're doing at least they the blur out face the faces or well, they try the to street. yeah yeah they do try and blur the faces with an algorithm, but obviously d that doesn't always work. Um, yeah? The, the, the fact is in the particular case of, of that photo, the fact that yeah. he's gone out in public and physically walked down the street and walked into a shop, he has to accept that people don't see unless he walks in the plastic bag and pretends. You know, he has, he has the right, I suppose, to have a pixelated face as he walks out, but the fact is that he walked into that ha uh, yeah. not house, but walked into the shop in public, yeah. so people will see him. You know, if I think, this was I think, a... I think a more yeah. valid for yeah. is Google Google Earth. We can look into my back garden and see all the gold that I'm hoarding. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's the concern, not what you're doing on a public high street. Well, it's the same. It's the same thing, right? But what if, but like in this case, you it would be hard to figure out who that is unless you lived in a small town and this like green stripy shirt with his car parked <laughs> next to it. You might recognise him from that, right? Um, okay, so Google Glass, where you can basically record everything in your, entire, in your entire life, including those around you, is that a good idea? How would you feel if your friends started wearing Google Glass? There's a term for that, glass hole. Yeah. <laughs> you'd be you'd, you'd be quite careful. What, what you yeah. say and what you do around that particular person, because yeah. everything is being recorded. Yeah. I think a few slides this way. Um, you pointed something out where someone said, uh, "If you don't mind someone knowing this information, it's okay." Yeah. But if you want the whole, if you don't want the whole world to know about it, it will change your behaviour. But what happens if it becomes the norm that everyone's wearing these? Yeah. I've got a slightly different question. Go on. So you know how on Facebook or whatever, to relate to this, you have friends, and there are people that are allowed to see your profile. So surely. Yeah. In the development of Google Glasses, Google whatever you call yeah. um, people that you're friends with, you know, like let's say all these Google Glasses can talk to each other, and because you're friends with this person in Google Glass world, then when you're wearing glasses, it can vi it videos that friend you're with. But if it's a stranger on the street, then I don't know, they're either blacked out or yeah, you know, see through or something. Who's going to implement that, and why would they implement that? Well, it's technically possible, but... For the same reason that, that, that Facebook allows you to restrict what people can see on your profile. Yeah, and maybe if Google's can see a business case for that, they might go for that. Um, should police be required... Yeah. If you walk around town with a GoPro on, if a 
Yeah, it's obviously not illegal to wear Google Glass. In this country, I know a lot of police forces already are already already wearing cameras either yeah. on their head or yeah. like that. And I think there's a plan to make it a require a legal requirement as well. Mm. So yeah. It would, would, it, would it be any So there there are that? arguments for that. But then are you then sort of giving Google information about what the police are up to? <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, well maybe they can change it so that they, that Google don't get access to it. But yeah, that's a good point. But um. Yeah, I mean, but then how many police officers do you have and then how much just public information are you recording and where do you draw that line? Should all, like, rangers, you don't have, I don't know, other traffic inspectors or whatever, should they all be wearing, <laughs> wearing these Google Glass? Do you guys have rangers? Who looks after the kangaroos? I don't know. Um, all right, so I've got, there's quite a few more slides, but I think we're running out of time. So I'll just skip ahead Edward Snowden uh, and we did just we did briefly discuss this in the ethics lecture so but uh, what a, but I, I will just quickly say who he is in case you didn't already know so in 2013 so you know just last year uh, Edward Snowden disclosed classified details of mass surveillance programs to the press so and his quote is is to inform the public as to that which is done in their name and that which is done against them um, and oh, I don't think that's like a whistle. Um, yes, thank you. Um, so uh, yeah, so it turns out that government surveillance is much larger than larger than previously believed. So according to their slides, um, you know they've got access to data from Microsoft, Yahoo, Google, Facebook, HowlTalk, whoever that is, YouTube, Skype, AOL, well. Uh, and Apple, um, the most worrying is that, no, just kidding. Um, so so they, they apparently have access to all of this information and you know there's been big debates as to how much access they had and all that sort of stuff, but they basically was, you know, according to these slides, they have access to emails, chat, so they can listen in on video and voice, videos, photos, stored data, VoIP calls, so that they must be talking about Skype there so they can access. Um, you know, and listen to that and pal talk, whatever that is. File transfers, video conferencing. So what this slide says, basically, um, they can. Um, so they have the, the, the online social networking details, and the way that they did this, it worked out. It turned out wasn't always. Sometimes it was with permission from those companies, but often it was also by um, intercepting communications. So they were on like a trunk. Basically, they had an interception between different servers in Google, for example. So Google didn't know about it, but they had access to that information. And um, you know, they've tried to improve their security in, in some point aspects. And there's a whole lot of other stuff to do with um, national security letters in the US where they can access this stuff. But I guess most interesting is actually that, uh, well, interesting to you guys is the UK branch can ask NSA for access to, for the, to this information. Um, and uh, it turns out Tempora is basically um, GCHQ stores a large amount of internet um, users' personal data, which allegedly is shared with the US, and allegedly includes recordings of phone calls and web browsing history. And uh, there are approximately 850,000 people that have access to all of this data. <coughs> That's the, the UK side of things. So. Um, so who are these interested people? Probably working in this building and um, and and other people. Um, okay, so your leader says um, what Snowden is doing, and to an extent, what the newspapers are doing is helping him do what he's doing. Is frankly signalling to people who mean to do us harm how to evade and avoid intelligence and surveillance and other techniques. There are lots of people in the world who want to do us harm, who want to blow up our families, who want to maim people in our countries. That is a fact. Um, so, yeah, surveillance um, obviously helps law enforcement. The question is, where do you draw the line? Um, and here is uh, Privacy International Privacy Ranking. You can see different countries raced on the um, basically ranked on the amount of surveillance that's used. And you can see 
some interesting things there. <laughs> yeah, because we've got systematic failure to uphold safeguards. Um, yeah, uh, it's all relative, isn't it? Um, so there's all sorts of interesting things. Nowadays, you can get your fingerprints read from six meters away. Yay! Um, so what does it mean? If you're using cloud services, it's pretty hard, but not impossible to main your, maintain your privacy. And if I get a chance, I'll try and talk about ways you can actually, things you can do about it later, but um, either in this module or later modules. Um, but essentially, uh, does this effectively create two classes of internet users? People who practice privacy, so know how to use VPNs and things like that, and those that don't, and therefore have all of that access available to other people. Rhetorical question. So privacy is obviously a hot topic at the moment. It's quite complex. Um, but yeah, hopefully that's given you some food for thought and um, just made you think about a bit more about privacy. All right, thanks a lot, guys.